Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Evan Gessner. I'm an attorney in Lexington, South Carolina. I uh, do a good bit of civil rights work and also a lot of personal injury tort action claims. Um, this is my first year judging a national competition, so I'm excited to be here and hear what you have to say. Uh, but I've been doing the state competitions here in South Carolina for 12 or 13 years now. Uh, so I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves. I think Francine, you're yes. up next. I am Francine Engel, and I am a political scientist, and I specialize in American constitutional development. And I currently work with um, the Maryland Council for History and Civic Education. Um, so I'm a judge from Maryland. And hello, my name is Jocelyn Broman. I work in Congress. I currently work for U.S. Representative Don Young of Alaska. Work done that for about five years. I am also an attorney, and previously I was in We the People and participated in nationals in 2006. So, way, way, way long time ago. But I'm glad to see you guys here, and we're looking forward to your statement. I'm Lauren Jensen. I'm Jules Petzley. I'm Amy Murdoch. I'm Amine Avira, and we're Unit 3 from Sheridan High School, and our mentors are Kim Ferguson and Mike Thomas. Okay. All right, so I'm keeping notes, so I keep, like to keep everything organized. All right, so I'll go ahead and read the question and let you know when to begin. So we have Unit 3, Question 1. And Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, I do not think the United States will come to an end if we lost our power to declare an act of Congress void. I do think the union would be imperiled if we could not make that declaration as to the laws of the several states. Now, what impact has judicial review had on federalism? Is judicial review a counter majoritarian practice? Please support your position. What limits, if any, would you place on the practice of judicial review? Go ahead and begin whenever you are ready. <clears throat> to begin, judicial review has shifted more power to the central government than was originally intended by the framers. Case in point, Article 3 of the Constitution says, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. As a result, Marbury v. Madison set the precedent of judicial review. Consequently, in District of Columbia versus Heller, a police officer argued his Second Amendment rights were violated when a law prohibited him from keeping a functional firearm in his home for self-defense. Ultimately, the Supreme Court declared the law unconstitutional, thus solidifying the individual right to keep and bear arms per the Second Amendment. In recent times, with public pressure on controversial topics that divide the nation, the courts must take court cases that would have traditionally been left to the states under the Tenth Amendment. For instance, Roe v. Wade ruled in favor of protecting women's right to an abortion in the first trimester, even though the Constitution does not, is not directly addressed. Dissenting Justice William Rehnquist said, in deciding such a hypothetical lawsuit, the court departs from the long-standing admonition that it should never formulate a rule of constitutional law broader than is required but from the precise facts to which it is to be applied. Furthermore, in Obergefell v. Hodges, the court ruled on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage, even though marriage is not a concept addressed in the Constitution. Equally important, judicial review is a counter-majoritarian practice, defined as the puzzle that plagues an unelected court every time it overturns the wishes of majority elected legislators of Congress. For example, in the city of Ladue, legislators deemed it unlawful to have expressive yard signs. However, the court ruled that it was unconstitutional to outlaw yard signs in Ladue versus Galeo as it violated Mrs. Galeo's First Amendment right of symbolic speech. In addition, in 1966, the case Harper v. Virginia Board of Elections occurred because Annie Harper was unable to register to vote as she could not pay a state poll tax. As a result, she sued the Virginia Board of Elections, claiming the poll tax violated her 14th Amendment equal protection rights. In response, the court ruled in favor of Ms. Harper because it was unconstitutional to prohibit a citizen from voting due to a poll tax. Further, Congress is elected by the people to make laws, while Supreme Court justices are appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Thus, judicial review is counter-majoritarian because power is given to a panel not elected by the people to strike down laws passed democratically. 
Additionally, our panel acknowledges that Supreme Court justices are more fit than other branches to make rulings that interpret the Constitution, as they are on influence and appointed for life. Therefore, we believe there should be no limit on judicial review. To expand, Article 6 states the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land, and judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Moreover, Alexander Hamilton underlined the importance of judicial review in Federalist 78 and established that the Supreme Court could rule laws unconstitutional if they do not coincide with the supreme law of the land. Furthermore, rulings of the Supreme Court can be reversed by either adding an amendment to the Constitution, as outlined in Article 5, altering the law to make it constitutional, or appealing to the court later when there are different justices. To expand, judicial review prevents federal officials from violating the Constitution. For example, in Strader v. West Virginia, the Supreme Court struck down a state law banning African Americans from juries. Additionally, in Lochner v. New York, the court trumped New York's law to limit working hours of bakers as it violated the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Case in point, the Supreme Court uses their unchecked power to uphold the Constitution. As former U.S. Representative Diane Watson said, historically, the judicial branch has often been the sole protector of the rights of minority groups against the will of the popular majority. We are now ready to take your questions. All right, great, great, great. Uh, hold on a second. Y'all give a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I'm just trying to keep track. Uh, I believe one of y'all had said something, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here. Uh, justice, our Supreme Court justices are more fit than, than I think than some of the other people we see in other branches of government. So I was wondering if you could expand on that, why you think a, a Supreme Court justice is more fit to get involved in the Constitution and make an interpretation as opposed to, say, the president or someone that's in Congress or the Senate. Um, as we also outlined in our essay, uh, the Supreme Court justices are elected for life, and so they don't have to worry about being reelected, and so they're not influenced by the people in that way. And in addition to that, in Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton says that he thinks that it's not the power of the legislator to see if things are constitutional, that that power should be with the Supreme Court, and so that also supports it. Well, what about, I mean, are there any qualifications for a Supreme Court justice? Is there some sort of a, you know minimum education, or do you know? We have not studied that, but we the people has taught us so much about American government, and we believe that they are more fit because they, as my colleague said, they don't have to worry about re-election, and so there are many instances such as um, the issue with dark money in Montana where the governor was or he was charged with fraud and with trees or not treason but he was uh, in trouble for bribe. yes accepted he was a bribe. accepted a bribe and so judicial the Supreme Court is more fit because they do not have to deal with bribes and they don't have to worry about re-election. In addition, they're appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, so they have to pass through that and that's a check on the Supreme Court justices from those branches. Okay, so um, also, go ahead. I was just gonna say like, you know, leaders in American history, have, like Abraham Lincoln, you know, didn't have like the greatest education growing up, but he still was able to grow up to be president, so. I don't know about Supreme Court justices, but you don't have to have an amazing education to be successful. Uh, so one of the things that you said of your statement is, you know, they use their, the phrase you use was unchecked power of judicial review. Um, is, is the power of judicial review completely unchecked um, if court hands down a decision that they really don't like in some way. Is there any way that the other two branches of the government can respond to that and check the court in some way? Um, it can be seen in Roe v. Wade, which was a court rule that seven to two, and it was left as a president. Um, however, in Marbury v. Madison, it was ruled as a super president, so decisions cannot be changed in the future. In addition, in the case Hortress Review, uh, Georgia, you can see that the president didn't actually not listen to the decision made by the Supreme Court. So it's, they can, I guess the president can kind of ignore it in that way. However, the only other checks rather than that would be um, to impeach a justice. And as I said earlier, 
uh, they have to be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So that's also a check on him. However, the last justice that was uh, tried to be impeached was in 1805, but he was acquitted. And so there have not been any justices impeached. Also, court cases can be overturned, like Plessy v. Ferguson was overturned by Brown v. Board of Education. So if a decision isn't applicable currently, it can be overturned. In your statement, you talked about the that judicial review was counter majoritarian. Is that a good thing? I do believe that is a good thing because we also talked about the case Ledoux versus Galeo in which the town legislators who are democratically elected deemed made an on made it unlawful to have yard signs. However, that's against the First Amendment right. And also, there's cases such as uh, Des Moines versus Tinker v. Des Moines, sorry, <laughs> which I particularly like that one because uh, our class actually got to talk to Mary Beth Tinker, which I thought was very cool. But um, those are times people's First Amendment right were infringed on. And so the Supreme Court, even though like it was a majority which was infringing upon those rights of people, the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional, and so they uphold the rights of the minority. And I would also argue that Powell v. Alabama, um, Korematsu v. U.S., and were just such examples of how kind of majoritarian the um, courts can be. So what do we do with the questions that are political in nature? Do, what do we do with the, when the court decides that they're going to start wading into politics and strike something down, even though it's not probably their place to do so? So I believe there are not many things that we can do, but examples of that are Obergefell v. Hodges, where they, as we mentioned are, are in our essay, they rule on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage, even though that is a concept that should have been left up to the states under the 10th Amendment. I believe the court only took that case because the states were arguing and they could not come up with a decision similar to Roe v. Wade. And so I believe that is an instance of the courts abusing their power. Another example of this is Wyoming is actually legalizing marijuana um, of April 20th of next year. And so that would be another example because that would be going against the federal uh, law of marijuana. Oh, I can ask more questions. I'm excited. Um, <laughs> what about, <laughs> we all love these things. This is why we do this. What about the confirmation process? Are you concerned about how partisan that it seems to be, especially for federal judges? As seen with Amy Coney Barrett, there was a division among the people because of Trump's appointment of her, because she she is a very smart woman, as you can see with the instance of her holding up a blank notepad. And I believe that Although political parties are very divided, I believe it is good that the president gets to uh, appoint them because then the Senate can confirm them if it is a good choice. In addition, there has been a, a press to increase the number of Supreme Court justices from 9 to 13. However, our panel as a whole disagrees with this because we believe that then the court would be packed with Democratic justices. An example of this would, so be, would be one sided. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, an example of this would be the election of 1800 when Andrew Jackson packed the courts. John Adams. John Adams. John Adams packed the courts. With his midnight of Also, um, the, like, that, that could be really bad because the judicial branch is kind of like the last level of defense, I guess, is in a way to put it. Like, if the legislative branch passes it and then the judicial branch, they're the last line of defense that could say, oh, no, this isn't constitutional. But if all of it was democratic, then it would be less likely to, like, it, they could push their agenda forward, even if it wasn't constitutional. So what if that plan to expand the court actually, so they would add on three seats, but the next three presidents would add on a judge each time. Would that be fair? That is within their power, but I believe that would not be fair because we've had nine justices since before 1850 and they are very good at the job and I believe that it is important to have a, um, a, a range or it is good to have a John variety of judges. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. 
Okay, and so I believe that it is important to keep the nine justices instead of adding more. So then it keeps the Supreme Court separated from the other branches and not involved in politics. All right, time. Well, let's all uh, give the students a round of applause for their uh, hard work. And presentation. Great job. And now uh, we'll have the judges do some feedback. Hey guys, great job. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think as I said earlier, that was a lot of information coming at me really fast. Uh, you're all clearly very well prepared. It, uh, one of the categories we we score on is constitutional application, you know, is supporting evidence. And, and y'all gave a ton of that. Uh, y'all did a really great job. And, uh, you know, while we were preparing for this to here this uh, today, one of the things we talked about is, you know, kind of what's going on in current events that might be relevant to this question. And the one thing I thought about was the court packing. Y'all came up with something that I was looking for and had a great job. Uh, you debated that very well. Um, the only thing I would add to that is I think if every time you had a, a president pack the court so the Supreme Court ruled more with his or her party's ideology, you know, it's only going to take a little while before we have about 47 judges. On the <laughs> court. And uh, I don't know if you learned this, but when, when you argue in front of the Supreme Court, you go up there and you have a block of time and you get you have your argument. And I think it's like 15 minutes. And, and, they, you go to make your argument, but unlike here today, they can cut you off and ask a question whenever they feel like it. And so normally you can't even get your argument out before you get interrupted and, the, and they ask you questions and then your time's up and that's just tough luck. So I don't see how you would possibly do that with a, a, you know dozens of judges up there. That's just a matter of practicality. But I, I think y'all hit the nail on the head that everybody seems to recognize that that's just a bad idea. That that's sort of <laughs> The Supreme Court does knows what they're doing. There's a group of professionals there and then leave it as it is. But again, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I thought you did a fabulous, uh, fabulous job. And you really um, brought up a lot of Supreme Court cases. And I was trying to write them down so I could remember them all. There was just, there was just so many, um, you know, not only like big ones like Marbury versus Madison and Roe versus Wade, um, but you had, you know, Strada versus West Virginia and Korematsu and the Harper case with the full stack, the Lockman versus Court. Um, yeah, you just you just had a lot of um, a lot of different facts coming out throughout the whole whole presentation, which was which was really good. Um, you clearly had a lot of information that you wanted to get out there, um, and I think you you were able to get a lot of information out. In your, in your limited time period. So that was really great. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, excellent presentation and great job with the follow up. I loved all the examples and I uh, appreciated how you use the examples to kind of make the point that you were trying to support. So that supporting it is very important. And you guys did a great job of that. A couple of things to just uh, help um, just to build on. Uh, one of the questions of like when we're talking about court packing, this idea that nine is the magic number, not quite, I'm not, I don't know where we quite get that. I think maybe it's just like done because the Supreme Court started with six members when yeah. they were appointed. So why we decided that nine is the magic number, I'm not sure. So I think that there could be a little bit more um, nuance in how we all kind of view that. But you got the way that you were arguing it was good and glad with that. The other thing I'll mention is that this kind of political question issue that we're kind of talking about. When do we kind of decide like when is a what is a constitutional issue and what is a political issue and how do we figure out what that looks like? That's probably something I would have liked to hear a little bit more of the differences between them and why like Obergefell is like not a constitutional case versus a political case and a little bit more detail on that. Um, and then just one final thing with Korematsu, that case followed the will of the people at the time. It supported the detention of Japanese Americans in detention camps. And it was only later that we all come to the understanding that that's not actually what we should have done. So I would like to see a little bit more finessing of like, when is a decision counter majoritarian and when is it not? 
as you guys are thinking about this, which just goes to show that all of these issues are very complicated and complex. And you guys have done a good job of thinking about that. And um, I just want to encourage you, like as you go forward, to just think about them a little bit more. So overall, great presentation, and it was a very, it was a fun time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great job, everyone.